Good morning, and welcome to the talk, This Course and the Science of Studying the Unsaid. I'm Savitri Kathawanit from the Graduate School of Language and Communication, National Institute of Development Administration. First of all, don't be put off by the word discourse, because here I'm going to talk about language. And I'm not going to talk about the language that we learn in school. I'm going to talk about language that we use from the first year of our life, the language that we use in our daily life. And this is something that is very close to our home. First of all, at this level, the language is judged by the how it conveys meaning. So the concept of meaning comes at the center. First of all, there are two questions to ask. Do we say or write everything we want to mean? And do we interpret only what is said or written? I think we all come to the same conclusion that we don't say everything we mean and we don't mean everything we say. So here we can see that the issue of the form, what appears in the text and the issue of meaning diverge at this level. So let's have a look at this, the form. Well, when it comes to the real communication, we use language and in fact, a lot more to communicate. We have the linguistic signs while representing the language, the verbal signs, any language, any code that we use. And at the same time, we also use non-linguistic signs like paralinguistic gesture, color, picture, shape, anything that communicate meaning other than itself. So in terms of form itself, there's quite a lot. Let's have a look at this picture. Uh, we cannot hear what they say. We don't see the words that they speak, but we can tell a lot of information from just looking at this picture. This, thanks to the non-linguistic signs, like the color code of the church. If you know the code, then you know that they represent a certain affiliation. And the gesture of the man, um, he might be telling the girls something, and also the way they look, they look serious. So they are might they might be concentrating on doing something. But more than just what appears there, we need some other unstated, something that doesn't have any form at all to help us understand more and to guess the extra meaning that is communicated. And it would help a lot if you can zoom out and see the entire context where they stay, what time, and what other things that you can see in this picture. So here, we're talking about language in terms of form and the meaning in terms of function. And our purpose is to understand the function. To begin this talk, I start with an ambitious argument proposing that, well, the presence and the absence of the sign can equally create meaning. So what is what has form and can be extracted has, is, can be meaningful in much the same way as those that are absent from the text. So since there are two approaches, two directions of studying language, let's start with the one that is most um, that is more uh, popular. Uh, the science of studying language, well, we, we have to start with linguistics because linguistics is the popular one. And when we talk about linguistics, well, linguistics look at language as an independent system of form and structure. Well, it is used, it has methods to analyze what appears in terms of the sound system and also the grammatical system. Well, uh, the smaller units of each system combine to create the larger units uh, on the condition that the unit must be combined according to a certain rule. Well, 
what you get from the analysis would be what is considered grammatically or phonologically well-formed or not. But well, to be well-formed doesn't guarantee uh, the meaning or success in communication. Let's have a look at this sentence. I got a sentence from my daughter when she was young and she was trying out um, difficult vocabulary. She said, oh mom, you are so boastful not saying a word. Well, I think she wanted to say, she wanted to use the word boastful. And considering this, um, looking at it, at it from grammatical viewpoint, it's quite correct. Uh, grammatically well-formed and the way she says it uh, is quite acceptable phonologically but when it comes to the meaning of it you will be perplexed because the meaning of words seems to be self-contradictory so this means that it is senseless to us so here is an example of how well-formed this does not guarantee success in communication, the meaning. So in order to look at function, in order to look at function of language, well, this is another direction of language studies. We put meaning in communication at the fore because we believe that language is used to mean something, to do something, to trigger something. Uh, language at this level is seen as an open system why is it open? Because it requires more than just four to create meaning. Well, since meaning is the central uh, interest of our talk today, let's define meaning a bit. Well, before 1930, what is meaningful in language must be something that, is, that can be verified. Otherwise, it would be considered meaningless. But in 1930s, which is later on in life of uh, in the lifespan of linguistics, um, meaning has been differently defined to be meaning as use. So language that can serve the purpose of communication is considered meaningful. So it does not have to be truthful, or it does not have to be well formed, if it succeeds in communication it is considered meaningful. And that is the beginning of the functional approach to language or language in context. Well, with that, it reminds me to think of uh, the metaphor proposed by Ludwig Wittgenstein in 1953. He said that, well, language is a game, language game. What does it mean this? It means that Meaning of words depends on the function in the game. Language can only be understood within its context. So let's have a look at this. Now, we are having a game of petong. And in petong, you have balls of two sizes and you throw and you get score. Well, the value of the pieces, the values of the ball, and the meaning of the move rely on the rule of the tongue. And if you know the rule, this very ball that comes closer to the red one has the highest value, has the highest score. But if you take this ball out of its context of the tongue, then to be close or far apart means nothing. So here is the same as language. You have to analyze, interpret it, in relation to its context. So here, context is the name of the game. We need to know more about our game in order to correctly interpret what goes on in language. Well, to know what language is, well, means to define what are the elements in the context. First of all, Context refers to the situation, the time, and place, the, particip the participants involved in the action, the social relations between them. All these defines what to be said and how what is said will be interpreted. Also, 
the context refers to other texts. And for those who are studying English language, uh, when you learn about a context clue, well, in fact, you are talking about co-text. The other words that appear in the same in the same vicinity would help you to understand the meaning of the word that you would like to find out its meaning, the co-text. And in this course analysis, not only what appear right next to your text that give influence to the meaning of the word, the, the other text that is produced around about the same time, so before, or what we call the intertext, also define the meaning of the existing text we are talking about. And also, context refers to the norm of interaction. What to be expected in such interaction? Participants' cognition, uh, the intention of the speaker also defines its meaning. And also the sociocultural factors at the largest level. In what society, under what cultural conditions that the text is produced? All these five elements are taken into consideration automatically when we come in contact with language in use. So this course studies is an academic movement, a perspective. Uh, this is a perspective of looking at language as an open system. Well, an open system means that, well, it is language in relation to the contextual factors out there. And this, what this course studies does is theorizing the text and context dialectical relationship. In fact, they just try to systematize the way we use language. This course studies look at the language we in use or discourse as text. Well, we have talked about text and text and text quite a few times before, but let's now define the word text. Text here means the composite of signs. And signs refers to something that stands for things other than itself. So anything that means more than just itself is a sign. And for this course analysis, it's not any sign. We're talking about sign in terms of social semiotics. Well, signs here refer to the way people use semiotic resources, both to produce, communicate artifacts and events, and to interpret them in the context of specific social situations and practices. Okay, so here we have a lot of big words like semiotic resources, artifacts, events, and also the social situations and social practice. Well, all these terms will be digested later. Well, first of all, semiotic resource. What are the semiotic resources? Well, semiotic resources refers to the use of resources, not just linguistics. It can be other semiotic signs, paralinguistic gesture, tone of voice, uh, character voicing characteristics, gaze, anything because these communicate more than just itself. Well, all these are used in a certain normative way, governed by normative discourse, but is relatively free to vary in a certain context. So it means that, well, there is a guidelines for using this, but people can creatively bend the rules in order to create meaning that is quite individualistic for themselves. So apart from looking for at this course as text, this course analysis also see this course as a social practice. Well, by social practice means that language is not just out there as an independent system, but language is part of the social network the network of social action, something that people do as part of the society. How? Well, it is argued that this course is text that we use to say something, do something, 
and be something. Well, we use language to say something like ouch, ouch, to indicate that we, I get hurt. Um, it also be used to do something. Like if you want to forbid someone from doing something, then you can tell them verbally. Or you can write down a law in order to forbid them um, in a formal manner. Also, language can be used to regulate. To regulate. Uh, and this can be done, again, in terms of the policies, regulations written somewhere. And only when that written document is passed, approved, then it comes into effect. And also, we can use language to discriminate. And we use that all the time. For example, um, well, the way we call people express our discrimination. Uh, like why we have to call someone gay plus last name. Why don't we call other person straight plus name again? Uh, so that it will be they will be treated equally, right? If you want to indicate um, gender identification, then you should do this to everyone. So if you do it to someone but not the other, that is how language is used to discriminate. And also the last one, language can be used, discourse can be used to be something. For example, uh, it is argued that identity is performed in language. So the way we use language indicate our identity. Like if I, in Thai, if I use final particle like ka, indicate that I am uh, a female speaker. Uh, Krap indicate a uh, male speaker. But if a female speaker use krap, then it indicates her gender um, identification, that sort of thing. So this is how language is used to say something, do something, and be something. And it has to be interpreted in a larger social action network. Well, because there are a lot more information that is communicated than just what is said, we need to search for the unsaid and how the unsaid is conveyed in communication. And in order to do so, I have four guiding questions for you. And these four guiding questions will help you to find pattern in chaos. Well, why do I say chaos? Because there are so many factors involved. Well, with these four guiding questions, you can tease out the information that is worth um, analyzing. Well, the first question is, is the discourse logical? Is the discourse logical? When you look at a certain text, and you find that the text, especially the literal meaning of it, does not correspond to the context at all. Well, does not correspond here means that, well, it seems untrue. Then normally, people commonsensically look for the alternative meaning to make it make sense. Uh, for example, when we see a metaphor, when we see a metaphor, um, like um, you are an apple of my eyes. Well, we know for certain that you are a person and cannot be an apple. So this literal meaning cannot be taken literally because it is untrue. That, that's why this triggers you to look for the alternative meaning that would make it make sense. So Christ's conversational implicature, cooperative principle, and the four maxims, including Sperber and Wilson relevance theory, whether that the text has to be relevant to the context. These two give you a criteria of what is considered logical. And anything that deviates from this meaning of logic, then we would look for the alternative meaning that would make it make sense. Including the speech act. Well, speech act here um, has to do especially with the indirect speech act. Sometimes we say one thing, but we mean the other. This is what we call indirect speech act. We arrive at the meaning intended because we 
look beyond the literal meaning of it. The second question, does the discourse conform to the norm? Well, any kind of discourse is governed by the norm of interaction. It is a set of expectation of what to be found in that communicative event. For example, in oral conversation. Well, for a conversation to be a conversation, it has to have turn-taking. People take turn in contributing to a conversation. But, well, this is the norm. And normally when one person stops, another person starts. Uh, but what if you are talking to your friend? Well, it goes quite smoothly. But then again, you ask one question and then your friend, keep quiet. There's a silence there. The silence here doesn't have any form, but it does have meaning, does it? Because it, at least it makes you feel uneasy. And in conversation, it is argued that even the smallest silence can create a lot of uneasiness. So here, the meaning of silence, the formless thing as silence, is acquired by the fact that it situates in the larger interaction of a communication of conversation. And also, apart from oral conversation, other interaction other language usage also is also governed by um, other norms like the discourse schema the genre the just register for example um, well when you read an email from your student well you have a certain expectation in terms of the term of address at the beginning well dear Ajahn Sabitri for example I don't expect them to love me, but, but that is customary. But until one day, I got a student who write an email to me to Ajahn Sabitri. And um, this is odd. And because it deviates from the norm, it can be interpreted in many different ways. And most of the deviation are interpreted quite negatively. However, it turns out that he does this to every Ajahn, and it, it seems to be his uh, personal style or something. So, so well, however, non non not by not conforming to the norm, create um, an implication of something, let's say. So the question, the second question, does the discourse conform to the norm needs to be asked. The next question, is this course consistently formulated? This is a question, uh, a very good one, if you would like to go in the critical direction of this course studies. Well, it begins by asking whether all the actors or actions represented equally in language, in a text. And because Critical discourse analysis deals with equality, and the issue of equality can be um, can be indicated by different features in the text. For example, terms of address, honorific, or the lack of it. Uh, if I introduce two friends, one I introduce by saying uh, this is Mister plus last name, and another one I say this is John. Well. This surely means that I treat the two person differently. And one, I give more honor, and another one, I give more familiarity for that matter. So this is not consistently represented as can be seen from a term of address. Next one, lexical choices. Lexical choices, like um, why this word is used and not that. Why when I refer to someone, I call him by the name. And another one, I call him by his racial feature, like the black, the white, and things like that. Um, this lexical choices, uh, what the word that I select, are carefully chosen among other possible choices. And this is an intentional one. So this can give us certain meaning about intention stance uh, of the speaker 
And at the same time, the last one, voice of actors. Every individual has their own opinion, and we have we are bound to have different opinion about the certain the same event. But if there are quite a few ev- quite a few people involved in the same event, and then we look at the news about this event, it is worth noting whether all the parties involved are presented in the news text, and whether the voice of all actors presented in the text, because And and also it is worth asking why we select this person and not that. Normally, people select the voice that corresponds to their own opinion. So this can be another element in a text that indicates sense and policy of the speaker. The last question: Is there a discursive feature that stands out? Well, in order to analyze something. In the discourse, we have to identify the salient feature. The salient features mean the feature that is distinctive stands out. And before this, um, we use our intuition to argue for the saliency. But later on, uh, quantitative the data is used in order to back up our uh, judgment. We can look for repetitive elements in the structure, and the more it is rep- repeated, the more salient the feature is. We can look for the keywords and collocation and the frequency of it. Um, and also, this means that whatever called salient, whatever called salient, can be verified with quantitative result. The more they emphasize on one thing, it means that that is the first thing that they have in mind. So, for this course studies, in general, well, it is nothing but means or ways to systematize human common sense, and because we have to look at common sense from in a systematic manner. So we have to start from empirical evidence and then move on to qualitative interpretation. We start with the discursive evidence, teasing out uh, part of the text, features from the text, using the four guiding questions that we mentioned earlier, and then once we have the features, use the theory or concepts in order to analyze it, and then. Move on to provide the logical interpretation of what you found, and if you are doing this course analysis just for the sake of understanding language better, you can end here. But if you are writing a report on this course analysis, then you have to move on to the fourth step, that is discussion. You have to provide the discussion of how text and context dialectically relate to one another and work together in order to create meaning. And on a final note, um, this course analysis tells us that well, we are born proficient user of one language or another, so we are the, an expert in this course. And this course analysis provides explanation of how we use language proficiently. And since it provides explanation description, this course perspective may enhance the language proficiency for L2 learner. Because we can, because this course analysis mimic the way people use the first language in a proficient manner, so we might apply the knowledge here to the learning of the second language as well to create the maximum um, efficiency. And for further discussion on this course analysis, critical discourse analysis. Please visit my Facebook page, Discourse Studies at Nida. Thank you.